Welcome everybody to Sing Ray's webinar of the month. This month we are talking about fall color with all in camera techniques uh, with Randall J. Hodges, who is one of our uh, longtime Sing Ray ambassadors. Um, he has been capturing images of the Western United States and Canada as a full time pro professional photographer for over 20 years. Most of his work comes from time spent hiking and backpacking in the wilderness areas of the West, where he has hiked and photographed over 33,000 trail miles. Randall's work has been published over 4,950 times worldwide in books, magazines, calendars, greeting cards, postcards, newspapers, and much more. His work appears in publications like National Geographic, National Photographer Magazine, Northwest Travel Magazine, Oregon Coast Magazine, Hawaii Magazine, Washington Trails Magazine, the Pacific Northwest Magazine, um, and the Seattle Met Magazine, just to name a few. He has won countless awards for his photography and he does not alter his work in any way. He considers himself an all in camera shooter and he spends the time waiting for the right light and color and uses so-called old school techniques rather than post-processing to capture his images. Um, only the smallest adjustments are made to ensure the finished print matches the back of the camera as closely as possible. His work has been featured in countless galleries and art shows around the West. He speaks at photography conventions and seminars. He teaches his out in the field lessons and adventures around the West where he shares his old school techniques on digital cameras with his students. He has a book, Images of the West, a 208 page full color landscape photography book. Um, and he owns the Randall J. Hodges Photography Gallery in downtown Edmonds, Washington, and the Images of the West Gallery in beautiful Cannon Beach, Oregon. So with that, Randall, I'll let you take it. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll get started here. Um, I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about my all-in-camera technique, which we'll be diving in along the way as we get through the slides and some of the images. Uh, all-in-camera, uh, first thing I'm going to say for those photographers out there who are probably wondering, uh, I do shoot in RAW. Uh, a lot of people make the have the misunderstanding that I must shoot in JPEG if I'm doing all the work in the camera, but I do shoot in RAW. Um, I have to use a simple process technique. I convert the images in Canon software. By the way, I shoot a Canon 5D SR. Um, I access the color palettes of that camera and I set them up. I call them my digital rolls of film as I have uh, used them to uh, mimic my old school slide films. I used to shoot a lot of Kodak Elite Chrome and Ektachrome and sometimes Kodachrome. And most people don't know you can program those right into your camera or get very close to. Uh, and then I use the white balance in the camera. I don't use auto white balance. I'm setting the white balance for every shot. And then the rest of the old school technique, once the camera is set up, uh, just comes with uh, basic film style photography, which is small apertures, long exposures, camera on a tripod. I shoot almost everything as you'll see in aperture priority. Um, and I run through what I teach my students. Uh, of course, there's, there's nothing like coming out in the field with a lesson for me. But what I try to teach my students is, is five techniques we try to master in class, which is composition first, filter second, focus third, take that fourth shot. Fourth, you take the shot, lighten or darken it with exposure compensation, get your exposure right. And then five, we adjust color. Um, We'll dive more into those digital rolls of film and more of that in-camera technique, but let's just uh, launch this webinar and we'll move on to the... So we've gone through a little bit of that camera setup there. Uh, no matter what camera you're shooting on, whether it's a Canon, a Nikon, a Sony, a Fujifilm, they all have in-camera colors. Most photographers don't even know they're in their cameras. Uh, and rarely ever do uh, anybody set them up because a lot of photographers honestly love post-processing and they'd rather put that color in on the back half than put it in on the front half. Uh, I'm just the opposite. I got to set up that digital roll of film on the front half and control it all in camera. Um, and for my all-in-camera technique, I need to use uh, polarizers during the day. Uh, for me, I choose the uh, Sing Ray light bright polarizers. I really like the thin mounts because I use wide angle lenses there. 
And of course, I have a full set of graduated split neutral density filters, the Galen Rowell uh, Singray split neutral density filters, and some other specialty filters in there, including the Randall J. Hodges Mountain Beef filter, which I use in the summer when I'm up high in the mountains. Uh, again, those in cover color palettes are pretty important and the white balance. Um, I'll just kind of give you some basics. If we were setting up a Canon and you were in class, we'd set up three digital rolls of film. We would set up your landscape, we would set up your standard, and we would set up your monochrome. If you're shooting on a Nikon, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, we're going to set up vivid standard landscape uh, and monochrome and if you're on a sony same as a nikon it'd be vivid standard landscape black and white and fuji films a little different they have their own films in the camera but you can globally set up the entire camera a base a very basic setup all cameras are a little different would be once you knock into those uh color palettes and by the way for canon that's going to be called set picture control or excuse me picture styles for Nikon, that is set picture control. Uh, for Sony, you can go by a couple of different names, uh, but wherever you find your color palettes is where you want to be there. And the Fuji films are labeled as Fuji films. So let's uh, go ahead and fire this up and see how this technique works. And here's our uh, starting image there. Uh, that's a fall drive in Snoqualmie, Washington. Uh, my lens was at 70 millimeters. Uh, oh, let me just go through my gear a little more. So Canon 5D SR. Um, I use my favorite lens is a 24 to 105 L series uh, Mark II lens. My second favorite lens is a 16 to 35 F4 L series wide angle. Uh, my third favorite lens is a 100 millimeter macro. And as a landscape photographer, my last used lens, but still important, is that Canon 1 to 400. I have polarizers for all of those, uh, which I would use during the day for sure. And a polarizer even for the macro, which I use about 10% of the time on that. All right. So this one, uh, aperture priority F20, 1.6 second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100. We always want to keep those ISOs low whenever possible for a better uh, finished image. Uh, 5200K, and this is in my landscape roll of film, which is very close for me to Kodak Elite Chrome slide film. Uh, the filter used on this was a lighter, brighter warming polarizer. And uh, light was very balanced because it's overcast uh, when sky's not involved i prefer to shoot fall color and just overall forest trails and trees creeks and waterfalls um, anything down in the forest i prefer overcast light because it's so balanced and and just so so luxurious i love it all right uh who doesn't love shooting aspens in the fall um, you know the critical thing about getting these aspens correct is getting the actual bark of the aspen as close as possible to what you're seeing there. Again, overcast day. I'm on that uh, 24 to 105 lens at 60 millimeters, aperture priority, F20. It's a half a second exposure on this guy, one full stop dark, ISO 100, white balance is 5600K. And this time I'm in that, my standard, what I call roll of film there. Uh, for landscape shooters, your standard roll of film or your landscape roll of film pushes the most color. The standard roll pushes considerably less color, 10 or 20%, and has a different color palette. Fall color can be so intense that sometimes my landscape digital roll of film might turn those yellows a little orange. So I back off to that standard roll, keep that white balance down on the lower side, 5600K for this one. And again, that light bright warming polarizer. Uh, and when, we, when I work on focus, I never focus on the very first thing in my foreground. I like to go about say 10, 15%, sometimes 20%, depending on depth of field, but I always am fo I'm always focusing in that foreground. All right, on to our next slide here. And then we had someone ask, can you explain the lighter, brighter warming polarizer? Oh, sure. Um, the, this day and age, since you can control white balance in a camera, you're perfectly okay to use a regular polarizer. But some of you might have noticed that a regular polarizer sometimes can put a blue tint on your photos, uh, particularly these white bark aspens might have shown a little bluer tint, meaning I might have had to warm up my 
uh, white balance a little to offset that, but that might also push my colors into a direction I don't want them to go. The warmer, uh, light bright warming polarizer is two pieces of glass working against each other. And when you spin them, it removes reflection. Um, the warming part of that is an 81A warming filter combined with a regular polarizer. And I use that just to offset that blue tint. Uh, if the warming is a little bit warmer, it, uh, I can just cool it off with my white balance. So really you can get away with either polarizer. Uh, I prefer the warming polarizer myself. All right, on to our next slide here. Uh, nice fall road there. Uh, this is a great example of where I would focus. Uh, right in the middle of the screen, you can see um, a browner leaf there. And if you go about 10 or 15% into that photo, right in the center, you're going to see another mostly brown leaf. That's actually my focus point in this image. Uh, I've got 24 millimeters on that, uh, on my wide angle lens on this one, aperture priority. F20, two second exposure, one and a third stops dark, ISO 100, white balance a little bit warmer. I'm shooting in a little bit of overcast, but also a little bit of shade light for this shot. So a little warmer white balance. And again, that polarizer is on there. Um, and let's talk about light. So if this was sunny, I wouldn't bother to shoot it. I'm going to have contrasty light. Uh, if I was a doing some post-process, I could take multiple exposures and blend them together and get over those lights and darks. But that's not the way my eye sees it. My eye sees that, hey, if I come back here on a in the shade or on an overcast day, I'm going to catch balanced light. So I just return. Um, and then I'm really looking at those yellows and the oranges and the reds trying to set that white balance. I was able to push the white balance up a little higher and still retain those nice yellow tone in those leaves on this shot. So we'll and then on to... Can you explain what you mean by like one third stop dark or one stop dark? Oh, sure. So um, for me, for landscape photographer, shooting an aperture priority is the very fastest way to do photography. Uh, some people ask me, why don't you shoot in manual? A manual gets me to the exact same spot the same shutter speed, the same aperture, but it takes a lot longer to get there. You can get there a lot faster shooting an aperture priority. I know I want a small aperture. You'll notice I shoot a lot at F18, F20, F22. So if I just set my camera to F20, the camera is actually going to help me out with that first exposure. That is rarely ever right for me. So I can use exposure compensation, which is on most cameras, it's just a graph with a zero in the center. And as you go negative, it gets darker. As you go positive, it gets brighter. On a Nikon, for a lot of Nikons, you push a plus minus button and it actually shows a number. So you might be negative 0.3, negative 0.7, one full stop dark. So that's what, uh, that's what the exposure compensation is. So whenever I say two thirds of a stop dark, I force that image darker in exposure compensation. So uh, here's a, we'll change it up a little. Here we've got a, a mountain view for mountain views. Typically I want some sunshine, either sunrise, sunset, morning light, evening light is preferred. Uh, up here in Washington in, in the fall, the sun's pretty far south. If you're looking north, you can kind of shoot all day. This one was shot right after sunrise, just getting some real nice morning light. Got that wide angle lens on set to 20 millimeters. Uh, again, if you look down in the bottom, of this photo, you'll see some, some red blueberries on the left, right in the foreground, but that's not where I focused. I focused on the very last uh, thing in the middle of that foreground. So I've just gone a couple of feet into the picture to focus. We get what's called a little back focus. So you can see that stuff on the corners right in the very front is still very in focus. But by focusing a little bit into that photo, I'm able to also to get Mount Rainier in focus with that small aperture F20 on this one. Uh, one sixth of a second, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100, 5700 K was my white balance. And I've got a Singray three stop graduated split neutral density filter on the Galen Rowell. And it's sitting just at that tree line and pushed just barely into that tree line there to balance light between the sky and the ground. Quite honestly, uh, doing all in camera photography, there's just absolutely no way it can be done without graduated split neutral density filters. And the reason I, I love being an ambassador for Singray is to me, they have the very best neutral tone to them. All filters have some sort of tone, but 
for me, a leaf filter is a little gray cast. If I'm shooting a nice uh, alpine glow and I'm getting that pink in the sky, a leaf filter is going to turn that yellow. If I was shooting on an icon, it would even enhance that more into an orange and I wouldn't capture that nice pink. Uh, Coke and filters, I just don't recommend those to my students at all. They don't come in one, two, three stop hard. They come in light, medium and darks and it, it just, they just don't, they're hard to control. And most of the other filter brands, I don't wanna throw anybody under the bus, but they all have an off tone to me, especially when you get into the darker filters. So that's a little bit why I shoot Singray and why I love being ambassador for Singray and recommending them to my students. If you sign up for one of my Sunrise Sunset classes, I'm gonna ask you to get a set and I'm gonna teach you how to use them. All right, on to our next slide here. And do you ever have concerns shooting at F20 given that at an F-stop that small, it's supposed to degrade the image? All right, so some people call that fall away or diffraction. I can tell you, um, now, first of all, I'm gonna disclaimer here. If there are people who post-process and, and believe there is, because I'm all in camera shooter, I'm not a hater. Uh, there's nothing wrong with post-processing. Uh, the, the real trick to photography is finding out what works for you and what makes you happy. So I'm not here saying that anybody's doing it wrong or I'm doing it right. On the contrary, uh, I have a very limiting style. Most photographers who do post-processing would think I'm absolutely crazy but it makes me very, very happy. But some post processors can become what I call pixel peepers. And if you zoom in a, a hundred fold on an image down to the pixel, yep, you're gonna probably see a little bit of problem shooting at F20 or 22. But let me tell you, I own two photography galleries. I make very big prints up to 44 by 78. It's not something my customers ever see. Uh, this is just old school technique. You know, cameras were invented and they had a very tiny hole. Guy put his, his head up under the hood and they had a tiny pinhole they shot through, probably like aperture 60. And he'd say, hold still two minutes. And they have to take a two minute exposure because that hole is so small. I still believe that's the very best way to take a photograph. If you are worried about diffraction or falling off on your corners, you can certainly back off to F16, F13. Just note, whenever you have extreme foreground, you're not gonna get the front and the back in focus. There is a difference between the sharpest point on a lens. Um, some lenses say they're sweet spots, F11, F13, F16. There's a difference between the sweet spot and center focus than depth of field, front to back focus. If you'll notice in a lot of my images, I'm pretty darn sharp right in the front. Like there's some reeds down on the right and left in this photo here at Mount Shuksan, and it's sharp all the way back to that mountain. Uh, at F13 or F16, that's simply not going to happen. Uh, what a lot of post processors would do today is maybe shoot that at F8, F11, F13 and focal blend it. But focal blending, unless you're very adept at it, has its own issues. If you've ever noticed a mountain you're very familiar with looks a little pointed up, a little pointier than it should be, that image was probably focal stacked. And that is an issue with focal stacking. Uh, people who are very good at it, though, can, can do a good job at it. So for me, all in camera, small aperture, focus in the foreground, long exposure. And this is shot uh, aperture priority F20, uh, one stop dark, ISO 100, white balance, 5800K. I'm back in that landscape roll of film whenever on a Canon that uh, blue sky involved. Uh, landscape is really going to give me the blue tone where standard is going to soften that too much and I'm not going to catch the, the pop I'm seeing with my eye. Got a light bright warning polarizer on here and what I forgot to put in the literature there is I'm also holding a one stop split neutral density filter by hand right over the polarizer balancing that light from sky to ground. You'll probably always notice a reflection your water's got more depth and darker than your sky. So you'll need a one or two stop split neutral density filter in order to balance that out. Great questions, by the way, everybody. All right, here's, oh, this is one of my favorite places on the planet to go hiking and shooting. This is Yoho National Park. Uh, this area is called Lake O'Hara. If you're lucky enough to score yourself a bus ticket to, back, to have them bus your backpack into the back country here and get dropped off, you'll be doing some of the most world-class hiking on the planet. 
And if you're lucky enough to, to hit that in golden larch time, like I am here, you'll see some of the biggest larch forests you could ever possibly see. Uh, this is 32 millimeters, aperture priority, F20, 1 20th of a second. Obviously, it's pretty far in the middle of the day, so very fast exposure, one stop dark, ISO 100, white balance 5500K, light, bright warming polarizer on this guy, and the sun was up high enough. I didn't need to use a graduated split neutral density filter. I had the sun right behind me, perfect balance light. Oh, I still still remember this uh, this trip just like it's yesterday. Outstanding. Ah, here's back in the Pacific Northwest here. This is over the Columbia River Gorge separating Oregon and Washington. I'm on the Washington side. I was actually teaching a class. Uh, one of my classes is my big fall color adventure. And this was our last day, our very last shot. And boy, did Mother Nature treat us right for this guy. Uh, F24, aperture priority, uh, one second exposure, one and a third stops dark, ISO 100, 5800K on that white balance in my landscape roll of film. Again, I had some color in the sky. I wanted to pick that up. And a three stop split neutral density filter over the sky, no polarizer on. Don't use polarizers at sunrise or sunset. They tend to work incorrectly. They, they hurt your photo rather than help your photo. Um, but that split neutral density filter and a holder on balanced the scene out just perfect, just like we were seeing. And let me tell you, I had some happy students on this day. Do you shoot an auto ISO or choose your own setting? Oh, auto ISO. Uh, all these shots I was, I was showing you, if I was in auto ISO, the camera would have kicked the ISO up really high. I would have had a fast exposure, but I would have had a terrible print. Um, to make big exposures, I always shoot ISO 50 or 100 whenever possible. Uh, if I had shot this, say, in auto ISO, it probably would have jacked my ISO up to around 2,000 or at least 1,000. I wouldn't have been able to go on any more than a 16 by 20 on this print. Um, as it stands, this print makes a beautiful 44 by 78. So just remember, uh, ISO is the speed that you force the camera to take the picture. Uh, if you're hand holding your camera, it's got to be an auto ISO. It's going to raise it up. It's going to force it to take a much faster photo. Quality Image quality is going to go way down. So just keep that in mind. A higher quality image is a lower ISO. Uh, well, uh, some of you out there may have shot this tree. This might be one of the most famous trees on the planet. Uh, this is in the Portland Japanese Garden. And I will say this is one of my best-selling fall images. Um, this is shot at uh, my millimeters at 24 millimeters on the lens, aperture priority, F20, three points, two second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100, white balance 5,600K in standard. Uh, these red leaves were just so red that we had to control that color a little bit. And of course, a light, bright warming polarizer on there to remove reflection. Um, you, if, I, if I could show you an image without a polarizer, there would be white splotches all over this scene and this would have about half the color. Uh, I would say this, uh, an hour, hour and a half after sunrise to an hour, hour and a half uh, before sunset, I have a polarizer on my camera all the time. It is a must use filter. If I forgot my polarizer, I wouldn't get my camera out. Just like at sunrise and sunset, I need those split neutral density filters. Without a polarizer, no reason to even shoot a photo in my opinion. Uh, I would drive to the nearest camera store. I would overnight, I would do something. I'd get a polarizer in my hands. I wouldn't bother to shoot. So any questions on this, this here photo? Um, yeah, do you have any issues with wind and low shutter speeds? Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, and that's a great point to raise up. My style of photography takes patience uh, and it may take showing up multiple times to get the shot. This was my third visit during fall color to this particular tree to get this shot. My first visit was supposed to be overcast and I visited two days in a row had uh, blue sky conditions, I could not get this shot. I went somewhere else for sunrise and sunset, but came back the next year, timed the, the fall just right again, 
had perfect overcast skies, but not one shot where the wind would hold still for me. Had a kind of breezy, stormy time there. I visited the garden three different times, spent hours in there. I spent, oh, I don't know how much time under this, squatted down under this tree, not one usable shot. Third year, I come back, get the fall color just right again. My very first shot in the bank, bang. Uh, I will say, I still stat under there, shot another 40 shots because I was in amazement that I got the shot. Uh, but most of them came out uh, still. But that's a very good point. If you're shooting a low ISO, you're going to have to be patient. Um, now, I could have, in one of those times, rose my ISO up. But in order to freeze the image, I had to drop all the way down to F8. And my ISO was all the way up at 2000. That is not a usable photo for me. And that's why I had to return. All right, onward we go. Ah, this is, uh, I hope you can see that. Um, got a little stuff over this image in, on my screen here, but this is one of my personal favorite fall color images. Another one I had to be patient for, but this will highlight just what we talked about. This is Lower Lewis River, River Falls in Southern Washington. And this is shot at F18, 1.3 second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100. 5600K in my standard roll of film because of those red, red leaves. Light, bright, warming polarizer. Now, if you look closely in this photo, down towards the bottom two thirds on the right, you will see a couple of blurry leaves down in there. And that is because the wind was moving these, actually, if I'm being honest, these super fine uh, maple leaves, they just don't hold still. Even if there's no wind, they just tend to want to do a little bouncing out there. And on this day, I remember shooting 55 exposures and getting two working shots. So, but I was thrilled because I knew when I framed it up, I had a good seller on my hands and boy, it has shown me right. All right, on to our next slide here. Another waterfall shot. Uh, this one is on the Washington side of the Columbia River Gorge and this is uh, Spirit Falls, aperture priority F20, two second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100, 5600K. And this one's in my landscape roll of film. There wasn't a lot of overwhelming yellows in this photo, so I could pull a little more watercolor. I jumped over to that landscape roll of film and a light, bright, warming polarizer. And let's talk about those digital uh, rolls of film, those color palettes. If you're in a Nikon, You've shot almost everything I've shown in your vivid roll of film. But if that vivid uh, color palette was too much, you would back off to landscape, has a little less color. If that's too much, you could back off to standard, little less color. And then of course, in uh, no matter which camera you brought to class, we would also shoot a black and white. This image actually did make a pretty good black and white image, but I didn't pop that up there. We're talking about color. But let's talk a little bit about that ISO when it comes to water movement. So here we've got some water movement. I shot this at two seconds. Um, if this had a, any more volume in it, that would have turned that water a little too white. And I would have had to push that ISO up to speed up that shutter speed to put it in the correct amount of shutter speed for water. Some waterfalls, two seconds, 20 seconds, makes no difference. They look exactly the same. Other waterfalls have their certain shutter speed. Um, and maybe we'll get to some of that. This one looked great right at ISO 100. Uh, I did test it at ISO 400 at uh, one sixth of a second. I preferred the longer exposure in this one. But whenever you're playing with water, go ahead and play with that ISO a little bit and get used to what you're doing with the, the amount of water movement you're allowing. And you can change a shutter speed dramatically uh, just with your ISO and that water movement. And since there's no sky in the photo, I would feel safer pushing my ISO up a little bit because you really see the fall apart or pixelation from ISO. Uh, we would have called that in film days grain. You would see more grain when sky's involved. Down in the forest, you can get away with it. And I wanna say there's one absolute rule in photography and that is there is no absolute rule in photography. So every rule that I teach my students, we're gonna break it at some time or another in order to overcome a situation that mother nature presses upon us there. Ah, here's another one of my all time favorite images, the Foggy Fall Trail. 
Uh, this is the Lake 22 Trail up in my neck of the woods up here in Washington. Uh, this was a hike I probably tried to get this shot in these old growth maples uh, at least 30 times. And I couldn't figure it out. I shot them from above, from below, from the other side of the trail, looking back from this side. What made this image was the fog. It took out the background, kept my eye right into these big maples. Uh, aperture priority, F22, two and a half second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100, white balance, 6,000 K, got that polarizer on again. And another part about the small apertures when some people are worried about the strap diffraction. Now, I really want you to look at the corners in this photo. Um, I know it's not a really big enlargement, uh, but I don't think you're seeing too much of that happen in here. But there's another side effect to that small aperture and creating a long exposure. Uh, in my opinion, it just pulls more color. Uh, going back to film days, if I was shooting slide film, I was always going for the longest exposure I could get. I would know I would pull the most color that way. So that's just old school thinking, old school technique. I still believe in it. Uh, in this image, I do have extreme foreground. I've got leaves right in the front of my image. And so I, I really wanted to use that small aperture to get all the way through the depth of field here. Ah, here's a waterfall shot. Uh, again, not focused on the very first leaves in this photo, focused about 10 or 15 percent in uh, F20. This one's an F18, 1.8 second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100, 5800K in that standard roll of film at 47 millimeters. Uh, this is one of those waterfalls that I call shutter speed wise brainless. One second, 20 seconds, this is going to look exactly the same. So it really doesn't matter on this particular shot. And Little fun fact about this shot, well, not so fun. The cliff I'm standing on to take this shot collapsed and this photo is no longer gettable. And that is uh, something about photographs. So for me, even if you do a lot of post-processing, if what you shot represents a moment in time, to me, you've taken a photograph. Uh, I captured a moment in time here that cannot be duplicated anymore. Anybody who got to shoot from here before has a good shot from here, happy for you. For uh, everybody else, you won't be able to go out and get this shot. For me, there's a line in post-processing. Once you put something in or remove something major out of an image, you no longer taken a photograph. So one of the things I don't care about for post-processing is people can just drop in a sky. So they can show up at a location and shoot their foreground and say mother nature doesn't treat them with a beautiful sky, a big sunrise, big sunset. They just go grab a sky off another photo and drop it in. I think they made a pretty nice piece of digital art, but they did not capture a moment in time. So for me, I cannot call that a photograph. Um, besides changing the white balance and using a polarizer, how else can you balance a photo that is balanced but has an overly exposed white aspect to it? I would tend to just shoot that a little dark. Generally, an overexposed aspect to it means that it's not being shot in a balanced light. Uh, that's just what I usually find, not always the case. Uh, this image that just popped up is a good highlight up there. You can kind of see the clouds. It's not fully cloudy out. So while I stood here, sun was coming into the scene and out of the scene and into the scene. And every time the sun would direct hit these trees, I would get a hot spot. Uh, Obviously in post-processing, you could either multiple exposure, blend that out, try some highlight shadows to get that out, uh, try to burn and dodge it out. Lots of ways you could try to calm that down. That's just not how I see it. For me, I was just patient. I let the right amount of cloud take out the sun and I could get a more balanced exposure. However, without a split neutral density filter, my sky was considerably brighter than my water. So I am shooting with a circular polarizer in this image and it's not fully on so I could retain some of the reflection, but I'm holding a two stop graduated split neutral density filter. This one's a half and half photo. So it's right down on the water line, balancing that light from sky to ground. Without that filter, I would add a pretty hard time in one shot getting this right in Photoshop. Uh, post-processor probably would have had to take a couple of shots, one lighter, one darker. 
and either did a blend, a composite, or an HDR to get this correct. But simply holding up that graduated split neutral density filter, bam, done right in camera, just the way I like it. Another reflection shot, uh, basically the same thing here, two-stop split neutral density filter, uh, aperture priority F18, uh, one-tenth of a second, one-stop dark, ISO 100, 6,000K in my standard roll of film so I could keep those yellows yellow. Two-stop graduated split neutral density filter right down in the middle there, right down to the water line with that circular polarizer on. Uh, this one is shot with my one to 400 at 164 millimeters. So I got to break out the big boy lens to reach across this pond to grab this shot. Shot I've been trying to get for years and finally the fall color was right and the wind was still everything lined up for it. And for me, that's part of the beauty of being an in-cam or just photography in general. Uh, I knew this was a shot. I knew it for 10 years and I, because I teach here, Every year I looked at this shot. Someday I'm going to get this shot. Someday I'm going to get this shot. And finally it all lined up and I got the shot. Uh, looking at it, you know, one or two more days would have had even more fall color out there. But I really uh, decided I liked the greens in the photo. So I didn't try to come back to shoot it again. Are there any downsides to stacking an ND filter with a polarizer? Uh, I, so one thing I would say is never screw a holder, uh, uh, holder over a polarizer. In my opinion, I always handhold the split neutral density filters. If you're just talking solid ND over a polarizer, I think you'd have to know the reason why you would do it. Some people think if they put an ND over a polarizer, it gives the water you know, and the water's a little rough, it's gonna give the water more time to look still. I don't find that. Actually, if my water is a little bit, has a little movement in it, I would tend to speed up my shutter and capture the detail in that movement rather than let it move around and get a little more blurry. Uh, I don't use a lot of dent, just density filters, but if we were talking graduated split neutrals, I would just hand hold that filter over the polarizer unless your holder has a drop-in polarizer then obviously you need the holder on anyway to put the circular polarizer in and then you could hold your split neutral density filters. I don't care for holders like that because most of the time turning the polarizer is much more difficult. I watch my students struggle endlessly with those and a lot of them switch back to getting a separate polarizer and a separate holder and just hand holding. So that's what I like, that, that would be my advice. All right, onward we go. Oh, here's a hot spot. I call this my honey hole. Uh, this is part of my fall color Tumwater Canyon Lake Wenatchee class that I teach at least one of every year. And this is one of those photos where you get every color in one photograph, something I love about the Pacific Northwest. Um, aperture priority F20, one third of a second on this one, one stop dark, ISO 100, 5800K in that standard. Uh, color palette and the polarizer on. Um, and this one, you could go polarizer off and you would see more reflection down there in the pond, uh, but you also lose a little density in your color. So it's kind of a trade-off. I shot it both ways upon final inspection. I liked it with the polarizer on. Uh, so that's what I went with in this photo here. All right, here's some water movement we've got. Uh, this is a, called the Cedar, Gris, uh, Cedar Creek Grist Mill in Woodland, Washington, down in Southern Washington. I have so many versions of this, I love this spot. And this is shot in aperture priority. You, you probably notice these settings are not rocket science. I'm using a lot of the same settings a lot of the time. Aperture priority F20, 1.6 seconds, two thirds of a stop dark but you will see my ISO drop to 50 because at ISO 100, I was not getting enough movement in this particular water flow. I've shot this before where I needed a faster exposure. This time I need a water, a longer one because I really love down in the bottom of my foreground there, how that water feathers its way through the image. It really finishes the image for me here. Uh, two thirds of a stop dark and I've got 
that uh, light bright warming polarizer on and the white balance a little higher in this, these yellows weren't popping as much. I was able to bring up the white balance. And I'll just say with fall color, you're noticing my white balances, you know, in the same bar ballpark between 52 and 62, 6,500 K. That's because I'm mostly shooting on an overcast day in most of these images. But if I was shooting in the shade, you would see that white balance shoot up to 7,800 K, 8,500 K. I've hit 10,000 K before. Shade light is very blue light. And you have to correct that using your white balance, which is a huge advantage over film. In film, if, if I was shooting this scene in the shade, everything would just be blue, especially the water. Um, and I used to use that to my advantage sometimes in film day shooting waterfalls if I wanted a blue tone. But with a digital camera, with the ability to control white balance, you can correct that really cold blue light. And again, if the sun was out in this photo, wouldn't even bother shooting it. Uh, that would definitely require post-processing and would definitely require multiple exposure blending, which I'm just doesn't excite me. And even if you did all that, I don't think you'd get the same color pop as just showing up on an overcast day. How do you determine how many stops the ND filter needs to be? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, and we'll touch on that when we get back to a sunset picture. Um, but with a digital camera, it's easy. Uh, you just put one on and you look at the top and the bottom of your photo. If it doesn't appear balanced, if your sky is still looking overexposed or too bright, your ground's looking too dark, you need more filter. But on the other hand, if you put in too much filter, your sky's gonna look too dark and your foreground's gonna look unreasonably bright. So what you're looking for is a balance. So I'm always teaching my students, just look at sky and ground, look at sky and ground. Does it look balanced to you? Does it look like what your eye is seeing? And uh, you know, since you can see it with a digital camera, you can keep making adjustments. Uh, speaking of that, there's, there's one little thing I asked my students not to do, at least in the beginning of class, which some, uh, some of you out there that do a good job at post-processing, you're probably going to cringe when I say it is never look at your histogram. I'm going to ask you to turn that off and I'm going to ask you to use your eyeball and look at the back of your screen and look at your photo. And I know some people just shook their head at me right now and they're just like, this guy's crazy. But uh, the histogram helps you take multiple exposures or helps you get a, one exposure that covers all the highlights and lowlights but it does not help you achieve an in-camera image at all. Only your eye can determine if overall you've achieved uh, in-camera image. You probably noticed that all of, almost all of my sh uh, shots are shot a little dark. That's my personal preference. I like the images a little on the dark side. I believe it adds more color pop. And I believe right at zero in exposure, uh, compensation in aperture priority, the digital cameras tend to want to brighten the scene up too much, compensating for the dark area. So this photo does have a dark area. It's right under the bridge. Um, now, if I was a post-processor, I'd probably go do a little burn and dodge on that to bring it out, or I might have layered in another exposure to bring it out. But that's not what my eye saw. My eye saw that that's in shadow and it's dark. So I just leave it dark in my photo. It's my preference. Doesn't mean it's correct, but it makes me happy. Can you explain more about white balance to have yellow? Oh, white balance. So white balance doesn't make yellow. Um, so when you're in my class and it's one of your first classes, you're gonna be given the white balance test over and over and over. I'm gonna ask you to shoot the scene at 5,000 K 6,000K, 7,000K, 8,000K, and then I'm gonna ask you to pick the one that's closest to your liking. Let's say in this image, you pick 6,000K. Then I'm gonna ask you to, to do a little up and down, 5,800K, 6,200K, what's your liking? There is no magic number to white balance. It is part of your artistic choice. Uh, some of my students like their photos a little hotter. Some of them like them a little cooler. Uh, I don't know. I like what I like, uh, which I think is in the middle. Some people might think it's a little hotter. 
Uh, to me, it's right in the middle. It's closer to what my eye is seeing. And what I meant by yellows is that's one of the colors I use to judge my white balance. If I push my yellows a little orange, either my color palette's wrong or my white balance is too hot. But on the other hand, if those yellows get too pale, my white balance isn't warm enough. I want the yellow that I'm seeing. But I would judge that same thing with red. I would judge the same thing with green. Green is a great color for white balance. Say you're just photographing a green grass lawn. If the grass looks a little blue, your white balance is too cool. You need to warm it up. If the, the grass looks a little yellow, your white balance is too hot. You need to cool it off. Consider white balance, the temperature of white balance, more like an oven. And you put a nice white frosty cake in the oven. If your temperature is too cool, it's never going to bake and get that little bit of brown top on it. Uh, of course, you would never put a frosted cake in the oven, but I'm just as an example, if you put that frosted cake in the oven and the oven's too hot, you're going to burn the top of it. It's the same thing with white balance. If your white balance is too cold, uh, you're, gonna, you're not going to get the color you want. And if it's too hot, you're going to overbake it and the colors are not going to look real. But the only real way to become adept at white balance is simply to practice. So if you're out there, Try 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 K. Pick the one that was closest and then move around it. Some cameras don't have the ability to shoot in Calvin or color temp. They have symbols. Sunny, cloudy, and shady would be the three you would try. Sunny is direct sunlight is 5,200 K. Cloudy is 6,000 K. And shady is 7,000 K. So you could try those three. Pick the one you like the best. That's how you're gonna learn your white balance. And a little fun fact about this, the cedar grist mill here was shot standing on the covered bridge here. So these are both shot the same location. Uh, it's the best fall I've ever landed on here. And the river was running high, which gave me great details down in that water. Uh, Aperture priority F18, one sixth of a second, two thirds of a stop dark, 6200K with that polarizer on. And both directions, both in the Cedar Grist Mill and looking away under the covered bridge, 1.6 seconds was the perfect exposure. Uh, I did back off from F20 to achieve the 1.6 seconds. I did not want to raise my ISO. I knew I'd be making big prints in this of the, both of these. All right, and here's a little more water control for you here. Uh, this has got some volume to it. I'm shooting right up the river. This is the Wenatchee River in Washington. Uh, aperture priority F18, a half a second was the absolute perfect shutter speed for my liking. I shot this at ISO 50. I believe I achieved a four second exposure. I shot this at ISO 400 and achieved a one sixth of a second exposure. But ISO 160 gave me one half second, and that was the exact right flow of water for my liking. Uh, enough movement, but not too much movement that it turned everything too white. Um, this was shot in the shade. So you can see that that white balance is quite a bit higher at 6700K. And I also shot it in my landscape roll of film. So if you look in the back of this photo in the upper right corner, you'll see a tree that should have a little more yellow in it. It's a little orange, but I had to, I had to do a trade off here because I needed that green blue tone in the water and the standard color palette just didn't pick that up. And since the foreground was the main part of this, I had to go with that. But uh, in a perfect world, I would have shot a standard color palette for the fall color in the back and my landscape color palette for the water in the front. And yes, the post processors are out. Well, you could have just done a composite and achieved that, but that's just not my style. And when you're adjusting for exposure compensation, are you using the camera screen to determine the level of exposure adjustment? I sure am. Yep, camera screen, not histogram. I'm just, uh, and, and that's a great point to bring up. So one of the things that you need to adjust in your camera is its LCD screen. I think it's very hard to shoot in auto. Your, your LCD screen has a setting. A lot of people may not know that. If you shoot in auto and you're shooting in lower light, the LCD screen puts out a different amount of brightness than if you're shooting on a totally sunny day. 
And that brightness may throw off your exposure. So locking in your LED, turn it to manual and locking in your LED screen so it never puts out a different amount of light will really help you achieve your exposure better. But then of course we have the, the problem with, we go download our images and do they look right on the computer? And a further problem, do they come out of the printer correct? Well, those are a couple different animals and you probably gonna to need to adjust your LCD screen on your monitor to try to match your camera, to try to match coming out your printer. And I won't go into printing, but you may also have to get yourself some print profiles or masks in order to get your prints to come out to look correct. But that's a whole nother webinar right there. So this is uh, Gorton Creek in the fall, Columbia River Gorge. Uh, totally different uh, feeling I had as far as the exposure. Uh, aperture priority, F18, one stop dark, ISO 160, 5400K. And you can see that nice long four second exposure on this one. Uh, I did shoot it in different ISOs, sped it up, slowed it down. This is what I felt was right for this particular scene. I really wanted to feel that movement going down out of the scene. And one thing I love about fall, I call it old school Photoshop. Yep, I put that one leaf right in the front there. Uh, but believe it or not, I removed quite a few leaves out of this scene because it was just buried and you couldn't see any of the rocks. So I, I removed a couple leaves, positioned that one in the front. Uh, one thing about fall leaves, you do not hurt the environment if you move those around. Now, I, I absolutely cannot condone that you go picking wildflowers and poking them in the scene in your foreground. No doing that. But uh, moving out a leaf or taking a stick out of your photo, old school Photoshop style, uh, highly recommended. All right, another, this is in Colorado. Some more of those aspens. Uh, aperture priority, F20, four tenths of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100, white balance 5200K in my standard uh, color palette. So I can keep those yellows yellow and that white bark white with that polarizer on. And fantastic uh, scene here. And I worked it for quite a while because I was in and out of sun and I really just needed it to be overcast to get the color that I was looking for here. And you'll notice that I am almost always two thirds of a stop dark, one stop dark, two thirds of a stop dark, one stop dark. That's how my camera runs. Uh, other cameras wouldn't run that way. I have um, some of my Nikon shooters, they're always one third of a stop dark, two thirds of a stop dark. Some of my Sony shooters, same thing. Sometimes my students just like their photos a little brighter. They're always at zero or maybe a third of a stop bright. Exposure is a little bit uh, eye of beholder. It's part of your art. Um, if you're in my class, I would just tell you when you're way underexposed or way overexposed, but I would get to know your style. If you tend to like your photos a little bright, I'm not gonna keep asking you to dark them down just because I like them dark. If you like your photos a little dark, you're gonna make me happy, uh, but I'm gonna tell you when they're too dark and I'm gonna ask you to brighten that up by a third or two thirds. And what are your thoughts on mirrorless cameras? Ooh, uh, let's see if I can answer this carefully. Um, actually, mirrorless make up about 30 or 40% of my classes. Most of them have come a long ways and I'm pretty happy with them. Uh, there are some I don't care for and some I do. But remember, this is coming from an all-in camera shooter. Um, so my number one favorite mirrorless is still going to be a Canon, uh, the R5. Uh, R6 is good, but R5 has very close color palette to what I'm shooting, but not exactly what I'm shooting. So I can't go mirrorless. My color palette is everything to me. So I can only shoot on three cameras, a Canon 5D Mark III, a Canon 6D Mark II, or the camera I shoot, the Canon 5D SR. Because to me, the camera sensor is its roll of film. I can get very close on an R5 and R6, uh, and then I'll talk about Nikon. So for me, Nikons, I always preferred their crop sensor cameras to their big boy full frame cameras because their big boy full frame cameras just had very little in-camera color or not enough in-camera color for me. Uh, the 800, the 810, very poor in the in-camera color department. The 850 came out and that improved a little bit, but the crop sensor cameras always way out colored the full frame big boy cameras until the Z series came out. 
Nikon put color back in the camera again. I'm very, very happy for my students. So uh, if you are just a, a diehard Nikon and you want to be full frame, I'm going to put you in a Z series camera for, for that. Sony cameras have, ooh, uh, no offense to any Sony shooters. You come to class, we're going to set it up. We're going to run it all in camera. You're going to see much more color right in your camera. But a few years back, about when the A7 series came out, Sony's also got an inherent magenta tone in their sensor that is very difficult to get out unless you completely strip your photo. So for in-camera color palettes, Sony's not my favorite, and it never achieves quite as much color as a Nikon mirrorless or a Canon mirrorless would. And uh, that's not me judging. That is my students walking behind all the other cameras and looking at them going, why is my camera not getting as much color? Fuji cameras, that's a whole nother animal. And they tend to have a little bit, what I would call a whacked out color palette. Um, but with a little help in class, I get my students to tone those Fujis down and they seem to do very well. And I will say that some of the LCD screens aren't, don't to totally tell the truth. I find with the Fuji film cameras that the LCD screen is showing a, a little bit more weirder color than actually shows up on the computer screen. And I will say with the full frame Nikons that what you see on the uh, older full frame LCD screens isn't showing as much color as my students actually captured. So when they download their images, uh, they're much happier. And that brings me to a very important point about my style of shooting. I shoot in RAW. If you shoot in large JPEG, you've already shot a processed photo, meaning it does not have to be converted out of the RAW file and all that in-camera color has been captured. But if you shoot in RAW and you wanna do all in-camera photography, this is very, very important. Um, you cannot open the RAW file in Lightroom or Photoshop. It will strip out all that in-camera color and uh, you, your image will look terrible. So all cameras have their own software. Sony has their own software. Nikon has Nix or whatever the newest Nikon is for the mirrorless cameras. Canon has Digital Photo Professional 4. Fuji has its software. All cameras have their own software. I have to do one little extra step, which is open the raw file in the Canon software. I do a file convert save as, and I save that as a TIFF. And it, you can either choose an 8-bit or a 16-bit. I choose 8-bit. Um, however, if I know it's going to be a gallery shot, I may also convert it to a 16 bit when I get an order for an extra large photo. Uh, but eight bit is some printers don't even read 16 bit. So eight, eight bit is plenty enough info. I shoot a 50 megapixel image. Uh, I convert it to an eight bit TIFF file. It turns it into a 144 megabyte file. That's a mighty big file. If I go 16 bit, it turns it into a 288 megabyte file. That's a mighty, mighty big file. I can almost make a billboard out of that. Uh, so just in camera shooting, just remember you have to convert the raw file in the software that came with the camera. A uh, good example in my class, I would teach you to shoot an in camera black and white. If you took that home and opened it in Lightroom or Photoshop, it would be in color. It has no idea you shot a black and white. I'll try to explain that one more time up here in my video. There's two points to a raw file, base raw file that Photoshop and Lightroom opens. And then there's the in-camera software. If you pull a file over to Photoshop or Lightroom, it's only going to open this. That's going to go away. It's still there. You can go back to that raw file, open it in the software that came with your camera. It'll open the entire file. So that's just a, a little thing. You get that lecture in my class for sure. And no doubt, I always get at least one student after class that calls me up. I lost all my black and whites and my photos look terrible. I ask them, did you open that Lightroom or Photoshop? Yes, okay, let's go back and open it in the camera software. Unless you have a plugin, some cameras have a plugin. You can plug into Photoshop or Lightroom that will bring that in-camera work over with it. So there you go. Uh, some more Aspens here, same old technique, aperture priority F20, 3.2 second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100. 5900K in my landscape roll of film this time. I really wanted to pull the most color I could using that light, bright warming polarizer. And here we go, more aspens, same technique. Uh, 
Let's talk a little about composition. So I go back, this isn't showing the whole scene, which was a huge bank of aspens, uh, probably about four football fields long. And I'm probably shooting about a 10th of it. Um, and I've, uh, this is actually shot right along a highway. I've crawled up an embankment on the other side of the highway, tucked myself into some bushes, poked my camera out and framed in the box this shot. Composition wise, I'm always telling my students and I tell myself, look at all four corners of your picture to make sure you don't have distracting elements um, or negative elements. A negative element is just as distracting as an ugly stick you might have overlooked. And then look at your framing all the way around. Uh, some of my foreground stuff you saw with those rivers and waterfalls, that foreground, that water will just lead you right through the picture. This I would call a pretty flat image as far as depth of field, even though it does have a lot of good depth with those trees going way back in the background there. Uh, but I framed it up, boxed it just so, uh, really makes the impact. Just remember the whole scene is not always the photo. Sometimes it's a little piece of that scene makes the best photo. Um, same thing in this, uh, that one curvy tree caught my eye. I didn't want to put it right in the center. So I offset the composition a little bit, but I am looking at the left side. There's two trees over there in the left side of the photo I really needed in the picture with a little bit of yellow in front. And over on the right, I got one little squiggly curvy tree over there that edged out the right side of this photo. Had I opened it up just a little more, there would have been negative space on the right. The photo would have looked unbalanced. Ah, this was a, a very fun adventure in order to get permission to go on the land to shoot this shot, but another shot I'd been eyeing for many years. And same thing with that composition. I'm really looking at the foreground, the layers, the background with the, the fir trees back there, trying to get a fir tree on the right and left to edge out the corners, the edges of the photo there, and try not to go too high into the picture. So just, I, this is boxed in quite a bit. Um, shot at f18 four tenths of a second one stop dark iso 100 78 millimeters so obviously i could have shot that at 24 or 16 the whole scene was all fall color but boxing it in made a much much better exposure and what kind of i framed the box around was three dead snags there in the middle foreground and three green uh evergreens there in the front of the left side of the foreground some reason that just called to me to see it just like that So here's one where framing is really, really important. Uh, you can see I've used, I put this tree and used it to frame over the, moved it to the left side of the photo, but kept some of that fall color behind it in there. And it's arching over the picture a little bit, framing from the top. And I've got that nice set of uh, yellow trees in the background, edging the right edge of my photo there. A little bit of foreground popping up in the right side foreground there and the river leads your eye right on through the picture. It takes all those elements to complete this photograph. Um, having the river move your eye a little left and then a little right through the photo is one of the way the eye moves through the photo. The other way is the tree edges you into the photo and then it takes you back to that fall color in the back there. So analyzing other people's photos to see why they pick the composition and trying to pick out those compositional elements can help your eye grow. But really, um, a lot of times I just hold my hand up and I look through a box when I'm looking at a scene. I don't really have to do that anymore. I've been shooting, you know, this is my 23rd year full time. Uh, I just see in a box. I just see these even at 60 miles an hour flying down the road. Oh, I saw something. I got to turn around and go recreate that box. But really work at your eye on your compositions. And remember, foreground, foreground, foreground often is more important than your main subject. Ah, Silver Falls State Park. Uh, there were certainly ways I could have framed this photo and got the entire waterfall. Um, I thought that looked too simplistic to me on this day. I really like seeing it through the trees. And I really like uh, the leaves that are framing it there in that foreground. And you can kind of see that lower foreground, how it's just framed on the left side, there's leaves across the bottom. And of course the fall color on the right there. And on the right, you'll see a little movement that's from that long exposure. 
uh, six tenths of a second, F18, one stop dark, ISO 160, 6100K in standard. 31 millimeters on that guy. And this is Silver Falls State Park in Oregon. You ever want to visit one of the best waterfall parks in the country? Go see Silver Falls. They got 10 major waterfalls on one trail. It's fantastic. Actually, if you go to my website, randalljhodges.com, I have a video series link. And uh, last video posted is Silver Falls. So you could take a little walk around with me and see this beautiful park. It's also one of the places I teach. It's so fantastic. And for anybody from the Northwest, you're going to recognize this, Multnomah Falls. Um, and this is a great example of movement in the foreground. Uh, no matter what I did, I don't know how long I stood here, but it was long enough that I might have lost my mind temporarily. I probably shot 300 photos, and this was the stillest photo I achieved. Uh, Post-processor probably would have shot a multiple exposure blend here, one very fast to capture those leaves still in the foreground. Um, which would have been uh, a good move in this particular composition. But this waterfall just tends to make its own wind. So even if it's not windy out, you're gonna have to use a lot of patience. And then the other patience on this one, there's nobody on that bridge. For anybody who's ever been to Multnomah Falls, you know, that's a bit of a feat all on its own. Uh, wide angle lens for this guy. I think this waterfall is like 720 feet tall. Uh, so had to get a wide angle on 19 millimeters aperture priority f20 1.6 seconds two thirds of a stop dark iso 100 5700k in my landscape roll of film and this guy and we're gonna have to speed her up here i see we'll bump through these last few slides so we can answer more questions uh, mount rainier national park myrtle falls in the fall same technique polarizer on small aperture long exposure 6300k in the landscape roll of film here and you can see in this one i've achieved pretty good sharpness there in my foreground and i didn't focus on that first uh, bow leaf there i focused on the second or third one for that focus point and this is uh revisiting a waterfall that popped up before lower lewis river falls in washington but this is showing the entire waterfall uh this one was shot in the shade not in the in overcast uh, aperture priority f18 and you can see it's shot late so it'd be in the shade eight second exposure two-thirds of a stop dark iso 100 and you can see that white balance up quite a bit 7600k to offset that blue tone that shade light cause circular polarizer on and here's just a collage of fall leaves Again, though, I'm standing above this with my camera pointing straight down. I'm looking at all four corners of this to make sure I don't have a hole. And I did move a couple of leaves around to achieve a full frame here without any dirt showing through or very little dirt showing through. Uh, aperture. Pro this is certainly a photo you do not have to have a tiny aperture for because there's very little, there's no foreground. Uh, you could have easily shot this at F13. Probably would have made a touch sharper image, but Old school dictates that I like to shoot this at a longer shutter speed. So half a second, ISO 100, F20, 5100K in standard, light, bright, warming polarizer. And this is an overcast day. That's why the low white balance on that guy. Ah, fog. Fog can add magic to any photo. It really works well in the, in the fall. Uh, I've zoomed in a little, 65 millimeters, aperture priority, F22. Uh, six tenths of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100, 6200K in that landscape roll of film. And here uh, back in Tumwater Canyon, another place I'm teaching, uh, 50 millimeters aperture priority. This is fall color and dam on, in Tumwater Canyon, 6200K in standard, uh, light bright warming polarizer. And here's a new technique when I shot this without a split neutral density filter, the water in the foreground turned out too bright and the fall color was too dark. So I turned a one stop split neutral density filter upside down and I actually darkened the water in this photo to get that perfect exposure. And that came from me just looking at top and bottom and seeing the water it was too bright, a little blown out and that solved the problem in this photo. So you don't only have to put those split neutral density filters on top. And here's another great example. I believe this is our last photo. 
Uh, Mount Adams in fall color, uh, 70 millimeters, aperture priority, F18, one sixth of a second, two stops, thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100, 6400K in that landscape roll of film. Uh, a three stop split neutral density filter on the top and an upside down one stop split neutral density filter I call the sandwich. So I'm darkening the water in the bottom. I'm darkening the sky on top to allow the fall color in the back of this photo to pop. Uh, that's how that's achieved. And that is the last shot of the webinar. So let's open it up for some questions. Yeah, I've got a couple of them here. Um, would you ever bracket three to five images over and under exposed and then stack them to get the best exposure? Well, since I am an all in camera shooter, the answer to me is no. I use uh, balance light and in camera balancing techniques, but photo stacking would require post processing. And um, that's not something I would do. But if it's something you enjoy and you think you achieve a better photo, I'm all for it. Um, here, here's a big, big thing here for me. There's only one way in photography and that photography is your way. And if your way makes you happy, then you're doing it right. So it doesn't matter what that technique is. If it makes you happy, you're doing it right. If you like the image result and you're happy, I'm happy for you. I'm happy with you. Any, any lengthy post-processing makes me very unhappy. So, and I don't see it that way. I, I actually, what gives me the most excitement in photography is seeing that shot right in the back of the camera while I'm standing there. And for anybody, I'm sure I've got a couple of students out there. They might see me jump around, high five myself. And I even have a catchphrase, pow, nailed it. That's in the bank. And I'll point right at my camera. And I mean it. I'm excited. I don't, for me, waiting to get home and post-process my images together to see if I got a shot. Uh, that loses the excitement for me. It's also very exciting when I'm out in the field and somebody else, just a random person comes by and looks at the back of my camera and goes, oh my God. And then I smile and go, yep, that's in camera photography right there. So if you think that uh, blending multiple exposures together works for you, awesome. I support it hundred um, percent. Can you elaborate on issues using a polarizer for sunrise and sunset? Oh yeah, great question, by the way. I should have touched on that. Um, at sunrise and sunset, the sun is too low. A polarizer works incorrectly. And what you will see is a very light side to your photo and a very dark side of your photo, or you'll see a big blotch right in the center of your photo. If you see that while you've got a polarizer on, it's too early or too late, you need to take it off. Uh, general rule, an hour and a half after sunrise, polarizer goes on. An hour and a half before sunset, polarizer comes off, except if there's no sky. If there's no sky, you can shoot a polarizer all day from, from first light to dark. If you're down in the forest, you won't ever see that problem with a polarizer, shoot it all day. But when sky is involved, you will see it. So next time you're out, have your polarizer on at uh, sunrise or sunset, spin it, and see if you've got a smooth sky. If you don't, take that off of there, get out your split neutral density filters. When is the best time of year to get the photo of the tree in the Japanese garden? <laughs> I wish I could tell you that magic secret. Um, I will just say generally it has, it could be the second week of August all the way through the second or October, excuse me, uh, all the way through the second week of November. Uh, this year it was crazy. I think peak was like November 8th or November 10th. And I've never seen it that late, but our fall came late this year. Uh, but I've also showed up there October 18th and every leaf was gone off that tree. So uh, if you're a member, um, and by the way, on that Japanese maple in the Portland Japanese garden, if you want to shoot that and show it professionally, you need to buy a photographer's pass. If you buy a photographer's pass or you become a member of the garden, they're going to tell you, you're going to get an alert. Uh, fall color still one week out. Fall colors three days out. Uh, Fall Colors Prime right now, they send out emails. Um, so that, that's a good pro tip. And speaking of, when you're trying to time certain things, I've come up with some, some tricks. Um, like when I wanna know when fall color's happening in the Columbia River Gorge, if I don't have some friends out there, some people I follow or I'm with on Facebook posting images, I call a local hotel 
and just ask, how's the fall color in your garden there, in your yard there? And they'll just say, ah, it's not happening yet. Or it's, oh, it's full on. So pro tip, just uh, call a business in the area and ask them how fall color's doing, how the flowers are blooming. Uh, anything you kind of want to know, you might just get by looking up a business and giving them a call. Can you explain again what you mean by roll of film and color palettes? Yes. So when I say roll of film, what I actually am saying is the digital color palette inside your camera. All digital SLRs and mirrorless cameras have them. Um, most people don't even know they're in there. So you have to do a little research. For Sony, it might be called Creative Styles, Color Controls. For Nikon, look up Picture Control. For Canon, look up Picture Styles. And um, you can read in your manual how to access it, but about seven years ago, they actually took how to set those up out of the camera manuals. Uh, it, it's unfortunate, but you're just going to have to dig in and find those color palettes in your camera. Every time I said digital roll of film or roll of film, that's just because I shot film for so many years, but they're actually just Diller digital color palettes in your camera. Just know that Sony's Canon Nikon's come out of the box, pushing somewhere between five and 10% of their potential color. So a lot of people will buy a big boy camera, they'll take some pictures and they'll go, well, this camera is weak. My cell phone outshoots this camera. Your cell phone didn't outshoot it, but it did out color it out of the box because a cell phone comes right out of the box with a color palette in it. Your big boy camera, your DSLR or mirrorless did not. People are into post-processing. They don't want to set up those color palettes anyway. Um, they, they might even set the camera to neutral, which is negative 10% of out of the box color on, on average. Um, but for me, that digital color palette is how I get this done in camera. You got to go out there and set those up. I believe I'm one of the last true all in camera teachers in the United States. Um, so, hey, if you really want to learn this style of style of photography, uh, let's move this up to the next slide there. Jump on my website, take a look at my lessons, come out, and take a class. The very first thing we'll do, set up the color palettes in your camera, set up the white balance in your camera, teach you how to control that color right in your camera. Uh, if my grad NDs have some scratches, do they need to be replaced? I've heard no, but what's your thoughts? It depends on if they show up in your picture. Small scratches, I mean, even a brand new ND filter, if you hold it up, might have a little tiny scratch or two in there. Uh, I would say no, but eventually a scratch is deep enough. If it shows up in your picture, then yes, you need to replace them. And I will say this, uh, Singray makes uh, a cleaner called Rayview. Uh, it's really good. Um, and if you clean your filters with it, in, in my opinion, it puts a little coating on there they're a little more scratch resistant and they're also a little more fog resistant. Um, but having a good pouch to keep your filters in, the pouches like that Singray sends out are excellent. They're, they're very thick. They're gonna protect that filter. They're not very handy for me though. So I, have, I like to put my filters on my hip and I'm generally carrying 12 different filters in that pot in, on my hip. So uh, right now I have a Lee filter pouch 100 uh, Mindshift makes one. I think that's what they sell on the Singray site. Uh, it's more about finding the one that's right for you. Um, but I, I replace my, my grads about once a year and I'm a heavy duty shooter. I mean, I was out in the field 147 days last year. I'll probably be very close to that this year. So that's a lot of shooting. A uh, normal person, you know, you might expect if you care for your filters, get two or three good years out of them. But once they've got a scratch that's showing up in your photo, uh, especially in the sky, uh, you're going to want to get that replaced. Do you print your own photos or do you send the digital images to a processing center for various sizes? Uh, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's a mix of both. Uh, here in the Edmonds Gallery, um, and, and just a sec here, I, this, this may not go well for me, but let's just give it a try here. I'll just try to give you a little tour here. This is in my Edmonds Gallery. It's pretty heavy on canvas. And you're just seeing it from the back of my desk here. Uh, and there's some metal prints right there. And let's see, there's a big acrylic print on the wall. Uh, but 
most of the photos in this gallery are canvas. And yes, I print those right in the back myself. Hey, I was successful. I put that back. Um, I have three big printers in the back. I've got all Epson, I believe in Epson printers in their chromium pigment archival inks. I have a 17 inch printer, a 24 inch printer and a 44 inch printer. They handle all my canvas and all of my professional luster paper prints. I send my photos to Bay Photo. Uh, I think they do a pretty good job in California. And all my acrylics are made by Nevada art printers in Nevada. So if you're interested in, in printing services, I could recommend them. Or if you want somebody that's gonna hand look at your photo and you want a good canvas, you can always look me up. I print for my photographers and for customers too. So, uh, but finding a good lab that'll take care of your photos is uh, important if you want good quality output. Um, no offense uh, to say Costco, but that's probably not the place to go. It's a place to get really cheap prints, but you may not always be happy. It'll be hit and miss, Let, let's just put it that way. Better to find a lab that's actually gonna look at your, your image and adjust it for their printer before it goes through the printer. Um, do you have any thoughts on the Olympus M1 Mark II? Olympus cameras are okay. They do fairly well in my class. Uh, the M1 Mark II is a better version of Olympus. I will say that they show up less and less, uh, which probably isn't a good thing I would say for Olympus, but it doesn't really matter which camera you have. Uh, what's important is you learn the technical ability to use it properly. Uh, I, I have plenty of people who have really expensive gear, uh, and they would do just as well on a cell phone because they, they just technically aren't using the camera. So whatever camera you have, I would say that learning the technical side and having technical ability is much more important than how much you spent on your camera or the brand of your camera. Uh, for me, what's important is the lens comes off. If the lens comes off, whether it's digital or mirrorless, I can help you. And you're in the right ballpark, you can take over and run that camera. And that's, that's the secret. You got to take over and run your camera. Just can't click it on auto and expect great results. Why not shoot and raw in JPEG and use the JPEG for in-camera processed images? Because a JPEG is a condensed image. It's a much smaller image. So if I want to make a blow up out of a JPEG, I'm going to be limited on size. The raw file is where it's at. You know, raw file converted to a TIFF is going to make a much, much bigger image than a JPEG. Now, I have lots of students that just shoot in large JPEG. They don't want to deal with anything after they're shot. And most cameras now, I mean, start at 22, 24 megapixels. If you brought in that large JPEG, I could make you a 40 by 60 print, no problem anyway. But technically, a raw file is the highest quality output converted to a TIFF file makes the biggest print. So that's why I shoot in RAW. Uh, I do have students who shoot in RAW and JPEG, but I only recommend that when you're not comfortable with your RAW file yet. So you got your JPEG process file to, to you know, post to Facebook or use until you learn what to, how to convert a RAW file. But once you understand how to convert a RAW file, there's really no point in shooting in JPEG also. So eventually just make a choice. Uh, if you wanna simplify your photography, shoot in large JPEG, you're gonna be very happy you know, chances that you're going to want a, a 10 foot print or small. So you're, you'll be just fine. But as somebody who sells a lot of photography, I have to shoot in raw. Is the Canon software an app? It is a uh, software you can download for free from the Canon website. Same with Nikon, same with Sony, same with Fuji. Uh, sometimes there's a disc in the box. Some people never un dig down in their camera box all the way to find their little cam their disc. But nowadays, uh, you just go on the website, you can go on Canon's website, find software and downloads. It's gonna ask you what your camera is. It's gonna recommend DPP4 and the entire, you get go ahead and get the entire package. Um, and then it's gonna ask for your serial number. So you, you prove you own the camera and then it's free. Just download it onto your computer for free. And all the other camera brands are basically the same way. Just go on the Sony site, find the Sony software, download it. And all you need to do in that software is simply convert the file. And then you, if you want to go post-process that or touch it up, take that converted file, I recommend a TIFF again, and pull that into Lightroom or Photoshop. Uh, but if you are a post-processor, you're more likely just going to work on your RAW file. But uh, that, that's not for in-camera shooting. So in-camera shooting, you really want to leave that RAW file alone. 
You want to just try to nail it in camera if possible. How do you keep track of all the places you want to go back to? <laughs> well, uh, I have lists everywhere. And uh, sometimes I lose a list, which is mighty frustrating. Some of those lists have years of, of info on it. I send myself emails, text messages uh, all the time and uh, try to keep, keep the list alive. Uh, I always have more spots to shoot on my list than I'm ever going to get to in this lifetime. Uh, but just come up with some organization way, just like with your images. And by the way, let me just do a quick how I, how I protect my images. So I do a shoot. They're on my card. I like to, by the way, I like to fill a card up because I actually show the back of my camera when I'm working in one of my galleries uh, to prove to people I'm doing in-camera photography. Uh, so I fill up a card. It might take me a couple of months. But every time I'm done with a shoot, I plug the camera directly into my computer. Uh, I don't pull the card out. I just plug the camera in. I turn the camera on and the computer, because I have the Canon software, it just pops up and says, do you want to download your photos? I say yes. It has a destination folder. I send all of my raw images to an external hard drive because they're way too big to, to put all my raw images onto my regular hard drive. They go onto an external drive. When it's done downloading, DPP is, is triggered automatically. It pops up and my last day shooting shows up uh, right, right below in a slideshow. I can see the last day I shot and all the days I just shot are right there on the left for me. So I pick my first day and I do a file, convert, save as, 8-bit tip. I suggest you come up with some sort of numbering or lettering scheme for your images so you can easier, easier to uh, file them. Um, I, I file by state and year. So if I shot, I just shot a, went for a photo shoot in Washington, that would be WA underscore 2022 underscore. I think I'm on image number 863 in Washington. So I go by state because a lot of times I work with publishers that are regional. Um, now my photos are still on my card. They're on my external drive. And when I do the file convert, save as those, my best of best, I only pick the best of the best. They're converted to TIFFs onto my regular computer hard drive. Now I have those images already in three places. And then I have a service called Carbonite and Carbonite, uh, automatically sees, oh, new photo on my hard drive. So now it goes off to the cloud. Now I'm in four places. Um, and then once a month, I bring another hard drive in from home and I copy all my new images onto that. And I take it home because I'm paranoid a little bit. It's my business. So now my images are four or five places. Now I feel like I could format my card. And I want to talk about that every day that you, uh, so that's how I protect my images. Whatever your process is, make sure you have them in more than one place in case something fails or you lose something. Uh, so you don't lose all your hard work. Every day you shoot your, your uh, card, whether it's an SD card or a compact flash, opens a file and it sticks all of today's images in there. If you're in the habit of just erasing those images, the card is, that file is still on your card. Eventually that card will fill up with just folders and the card will fail and you'll lose everything on it. You have to do a rescue program to get it back. So. Every couple of months, get all the images off your card and reformat it. When you get a new card in your camera, it has to be formatted to your card. Don't forget that important part about formatting a card because you last thing to do is have a card fail and you lose all your hard work. So frustrating. And it's very expensive sometimes to get it back. So just remember, format those cards. How do you choose the soft versus hard and degraduated? Oh, that's easy. Only hard. I never use softs. So that's an easy one. Um, you know, uh, so you got that filter, a soft, the graduation starts almost right away and it runs almost all the way through the filter. A hard, it tricks the camera. So I would say a soft filter would be helpful for a post processor that just wants to darken the sky a little bit, but is still going to probably take multiple exposures to blend together. But for an in-camera shooter, we need to trick the camera into thinking the sky and the ground are the same exposure and a soft filter just won't do that. It will never trick the camera and change the exposure. So I only carry hards. And by the way, let me just run through the long list of filters I carry. Uh, I have four circular polarizers. One is on three of my lenses and one backup. They're all the light, bright, warming, ultra thin uh, polarizers. I carry a, 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 one, a half, believe it or not, Singray made me a half a stop filter. And by the way, for my students out there, 
that's the filter you want. Uh, you want to get a half a stop. So I have a half a stop, a one stop, a two stop, a three stop, and a four stop all in hard. I carry those. I also carry an exact duplicate of that. So I usually have 10 filters and it's a duplicate. If one filter fogs, I like to put it back and get out the same filter and stick it in there. So that's overkill. But a half a stop, one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, all in hard graduation. I also have a solid two stop, which I use to extend shutter speed for waterfalls. Um, I also have the Randall J. Hodges Mountain V filter, both the V1 and the V2. And I carry those only in the summer because when I hike up high in the mountains and I'm looking down a river valley, there's always a V. So my filter solves that problem for me. Um, and sometimes I will switch that out with a, res a re reverse density filter. I don't find as much use for that as I used to, but that is also a helpful filter. So those are the filters that I'm carrying in my bag. And do you have one tripod you prefer or more than one for different situations? Uh, only one. Um, I'm using a Gitsu tripod. Uh, it's a Mountaineer collection and it's got the Traveler uh, ball head on it, the simplest ball head. Uh, because I'm a hiker, I gotta go light. My tripod with ball head weighs 2.9 pounds. Um, here's what I'd recommend for a tripod. A tripod should come up to your chin without raising the middle bar all the way. Because uh, if you raise that middle bar all the way, camera's probably going to be moving around a little. So pick a tripod that'll get up to your chin. Mine, I don't have to raise the middle bar at all. So it's very solid, even though it's really light. Um, and as little leg segments as possible, they make some really small travel tripods now. And it's got like seven leg segments you got to stick out. The more leg segments, the less sturdy. And the longer it takes to set that thing up, I'm all about speed. I can get from backpack to shot in 30 seconds. Part of that is how fast I can work my tripod. And then when you set up your, if you're down shopping for a tripod in a camera shop, set your camera on it, look through it and tap the lens and just watch. It'll shake a little. If it steadies right away, that's a good tripod. If it just keeps flopping around, that's, that's too, too hinky, not good enough. So that's what I recommend for a tripod. It doesn't, and you don't have to spend, you know, my tripod's about 1100 bucks. You can get very close to that with a Monfrotto for like 150 bucks. You don't have to break the bank to get yourself a good tripod. When you're on your own photo expeditions, not with a class, do you tent camp, trailer, RV camp, or motel it? Oh, it doesn't matter if I'm with class or not. I'm camping. I'm either backpacking in the summer. I love backpacking. Even in the winter, I'll throw in a backpack. Uh, and uh, used to tent camp out of a car, but now I have Gracie, the adventure van, which is an all wheel drive Ford Transit that I, it's a home built jobby uh, that I built in. I call it the cabin. So uh, I'm, I'm in Gracie, whether I'm in a lesson or on my own. Um, the only time I'd be in a hotel is if my wife were going somewhere like Cannon Beach, then uh, she's going to want to come. So we'll get a, we'll rent a house or get a hotel. Uh, otherwise I'm a camper. I like to stay connected to the wilderness when I'm out there and going into lights in a hotel in town isn't going to do that for me. Would it be a good idea to take photos of water flowing in the dark in order to get a very feathery effect? No, uh, you don't need to do that. Take that same picture on an overcast day and you'll get a very long exposure and you won't need to wait till dark. Uh, not saying you can't shoot in the dark, but the water's going to, the color of the water is going to be very hard to control. You're going to have to raise your ISO up a whole lot uh, in the dark more than you want to. So uh, the only time I'd recommend raising your ISO up that high is if you're doing star photos, Milky Way photos, that type of thing. Uh, but for me, no, I don't, I don't need to shoot water at night. The colors are not right. I wait, I take that back under a full moon. Absolutely. I'll shoot anything under a full moon. So there you go. I lied. <laughs> And what about stacking a warming polarizer on a Hilux warming filter? Uh, that'd be overkill. No reason to do that. Uh, the warming polarizer already has the warming element in it. And with a, like I said, you could just adjust your camera's white balance. You don't need to add more color or variant of color via filter. Why do you not use tilt shift lenses to shoot at F8 or F11? with some tilt to increase depth of field instead of shooting at F20 or smaller to avoid diffraction. I don't like the look, my personal preference of a tilt shift lens. 
I can almost always say that was shot on a tilt chip lens. Uh, I think those lenses are good to create effect. Um, like if you're shooting off a mountaintop uh, down at a town and use a tilt chip lens, you can almost make it look, uh, well, very artistic, I'll just say. Uh, but tilt chip lenses for me, it just it's just a personal preference. There's nothing wrong with using them, absolutely not. Uh, but for me, it doesn't give the look I'm looking for. And do you do much winter photography in snow? I try to, although that is the hardest photography. I was just talking to a buddy of mine who might even be on the call. Uh, his name's Randy. Uh, he's my video guy. And we, we, we're get, we got to get out in the winter. I, I failed last year to even get one good gallery winter shot. So uh, it's harder to get to because the locations are harder to get to. But here in the Northwest, we do have many good locations. Uh, Mount Baker area, Snow Stevens Pass, Snoqualmie Pass. Um, all the mountains have highways going up real close to them that you can get close enough and snowshoe off from there. It's just, it's the most difficult photography because it's really hard to get and stay in the back country. But I'm not opposed to winter camping. Go on my website, you'll see my tents and star photos out in the winter. And that's how I get a lot of those shots. Um, Lightroom has a profile for camera and lens. Is that the plugin you were talking about for Nikon and Canon? Uh, no. Um, it might be, but that generally helps do lens correction. Uh, but if it does bring over the color palettes, the easiest way to test it is to go shoot a black and white in the camera and raw and use that plugin and drag your raw file over to Lightroom. If it's in color, then no, it didn't work. If it's in black and white, hey, it worked. All right. Do you add a copyright or a watermark or post a lower quality image on Facebook and your website to avoid other people copying your images? Absolutely. Uh, all of the images on my website have my watermark, which is actually just my digital signature. It's my actual signature. Um, if you're really paranoid, it'd be better just to use a text in Photoshop and put your name or your website down there. I don't think that looks good myself, although it is safer. So your, your name is always attached to that image. Also in your camera, you, you can internally copyright your image in your camera. And then in Photoshop and in Lightroom, you can do file info and then copyright that digitally internally, which you should absolutely do. Because even if it's stolen, it's time stamped with the date you shot it and your copyright. Uh, so yes, and I do shrink my photos down very small to post to Facebook. They're like 250 kilobytes. Uh, and you, um, there's many ways to do that. And you can find out how small you want them, but Facebook is gonna dumb down your image in a funky way also. So even though I don't post process, when I post to Facebook, I do do a smart sharpen on that image because Facebook, uh, just kind of ruins the photo a little bit and that helps overcome that. Um, and same thing on my website. For websites to run properly, those you can't do big images. So it's like 1600 pixels across at 72 DPI. It's very small and it's a web save as format, uh, which correct makes them better quality in a smaller image. And you can find that under four. When you do a file save, look for web format. Uh, That'll, that'll make a smaller, higher quality image to post. But yes, that, that'd that be very important. If you post a big image to Facebook, Facebook's going to dumb it down to, to get it on there anyway. Um, but you don't want people to be able to right-click copy your, your, your photo. So find, find a way that works for you. But yeah, that's very important. Um, and can you repeat the name of the tripod and what camera bag do you use? Uh, Gitzo is the tripod. And if I'm saying that right, Gitzo, Gitzu, G-I-T-Z-O uh, is my tripod. Love it. Uh, fantastic. Um, I have a REI Traverse is my backpack. And I what I call my camera purse that my camera goes in is actually a low pro uh, 170 AW. That is just big enough to hold my filter pouch, one camera, one lens, five batteries, extra polarizer, extra cable release, the filter holder, um, and uh, multiple cards and lots of lens cloths all fit in my camera purse and my tripod and my camera bag actually go inside my backpack. 
So when I'm hiking, you should never, never hike with, in my opinion, a camera around your neck. If you fall down, it's going to break you and you're going to break it. And it'll break you bad too. It'll break your ribs. Um, you vest a lot in your camera, put it on your back. I like to hike with hiking poles for safety. Leave your hands free while you're, while you're hiking around. So I like a fitted backpack. There's a lot of gadget bags out there that have lots of cool components and hold photo gear really good. They just don't wear good. They feel really heavy on your back because they don't have good shoulder harness and good hip belt, which I think is critical. Uh, a good backpack will make 40 pounds feel like 20. A bad backpack with bad sh shoulder harness and hip belt will make 20 pounds feel like 40. So uh, if you go to some place like REI or a, a good place and buy a, a fit, they will fit the backpack to your back. So that's what I think is better. Um, and do you ever use a color combo polarizer instead of the warming? I don't. However, as an ambassador for uh, Singray, I, I, I try to get in on testing all their filters. Um, for me, the color combo, just in my opinion, puts too much of a blue tint in the photo. And I honestly, Mother Nature puts a really good color out there for me. So I don't need to add to it. I need to be patient and show up in the right light at the right time um, in order to get that color. So uh, that's for me. Uh, the warming polarizer, I only use to offset the blue tint of a polarizer. Otherwise, um, I don't prefer any kind of tinting or, or coloring of the photo myself. Okay. Uh, that's it for our questions tonight. Thank you so much, Randall, for hanging out with us and going through all those questions. Oh, my um, pleasure. Perfect timing on, on the presentation. And we just love having you as a presenter. Well, and by the way, everybody, me and Michelle will be right back here in December. I think that's December 15th, right, Michelle, if I remember. Yeah. Um, and I'll be doing Washington's Big Five Volcanoes. So it'll be on mountain photography. Come on back and join us. I'll dig more into this all in camera stuff and we'll, we'll deal with some different color palettes and some different images. And on the screen, you can see there, if you want to, you can jump on Singray and, and look at some of the stuff I post there under as an ambassador. You see my website there, randalljhodges.com. You can Facebook me either at Randall J. Hodges or Randall J. Hodges Photography, my business page. Instagram is actually at Randall J. Hodges. Or uh, from my website, you can click on videos and watch some videos of me out in the field. You really get a feel for what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And a lot of the videos, I show you the back of the camera and I walk, you know, give you a little bit. And coming up in the future, and I, I don't know when, uh, I just spent the last film year with my video guy filming an entire video lesson series that's going to cover all the aspects of photography from intro to advanced and it's going to cover like beaches waterfalls forest trails star photography all of that stuff for in-camera shooting probably got about a year's worth of editing to do but eventually i'm going to release that for people who can't get out in the field for with me but really as an all-in-camera teacher and shooter there's just no substitute from come out, take a class with me. Even if it's just a one day, four hour class, I will blow your mind with what I teach you to do right in your camera. So jump on the website, look at the lesson schedule and feel free uh, to email me, randall at randalljhodges.com if you have any questions um, or all that info is on my website. You can call me up, chat with me, whatever you need, I'm here to help. So we appreciate you all coming out. Thank you so much. And of course, you know, Happy shooting. Get out there and practice. Thank you.